And thank you, everybody, to, for uh, coming here. Thank you to the Asian Art Museum for um, inviting, um, inviting me and, um, and my fellow speakers to uh, come talk to you. Um, the subject of tonight is memes, puns, and selfies, a look at Chinese digital culture. I want to emphasize it's just a look. Um, it's a small slice of a population, an um, internet population of 600 million people, twice the size of uh, the, you know, the, the popula almost twice the size of the population of the United States. Um, but we hope that in, with, by giving you this glimpse um, of Chinese culture, we, of Chinese internet culture, and um, we can pique your curiosity about um, learning more. This is a picture I took in Switzerland. It's a Chinese tourist uh, taking a selfie uh, with a selfie stick. Um, I'll talk more about it later tonight, but I just want to leave that up here and, um, and with the hashtag and all the Twitter information. When developing the title for this event, I wanted to make explicit what we're exploring tonight. It's the creative side of China's internet and the many ways people build culture on the internet through creative actions that are often ignored or dismissed in discourse on the internet and society. There are indeed memes to explore. We'll be looking at those today and puns to learn. We'll have those in the workshop this, after, um, this evening. Um, we have a selfie station, as Mark mentioned, and um, I have a selfie stick that I will be wielding liberally after this event. But before I begin, I just wanted to ask, why study digital culture? Why is this important? Um, so often the study of the digital is focused on algorithms, data sets, and monetization. This is important work. It fuels the very platforms in which the internet is built, and as um, a product manager myself, I'm engaged in this work as well. But we also have to remember that the internet is a powerful driver of culture. It's a space of cute cats and weird gifts and feeling all the feels. It is the internet that gave us new words in English like LOL, selfie, and WTF. And as we'll see tonight, there are new and wacky and wonderful words in Chinese as well. My own research interests lie in the internet's role in the social movements of today's networked world, from racial and queer justice in the US, to issues of environment and social equity in China, to LGBT rights in East Africa. Though there's much hate and oppression on the internet, I'm convinced of the internet's potential as a vehicle for creative and societal liberation, especially for people who live who are marginalized and censored. But I want to move away from talking just about these very serious issues tonight because culture, as it so often does, it migrates between the very profound and provocative to the very playful and fun, between online and offline, between east and west, north and south. This is as true in China as it is in the English-speaking world, as I'm sure we're all noticing with all the rainbows floating around on our social media feeds. Culture should be seen less like building blocks and more like Play-Doh. And so back to China. For tonight's event, I've invited some leading cultural thinkers in the United States and greater China whose practices merge the digital and physical. Their lives, like mine, have been lived on both sides of the Pacific, connected as much by airplanes and food as by smartphones and websites. The aim of tonight's event is to offer you, again, a very small slice of the visual and verbal culture on the Chinese web. We can only offer glimpses into different corners of this much broader uh, Chinese-speaking web. And, um, but keeping in mind that rhetoric around censorship obscures just how porous and wacky and wonderful Chinese digital culture can be. And rhetoric about the Chinese internet also obscures the incredible diversity and, um, that, we, that we find um, on different corners of, this, of the internet. And in offering this glimpse, again, I hope we can pique your curiosity, not just about Chinese digital culture, but about your digital culture as well. And it's through studying internet culture that we can understand culture more generally. And in understanding culture, we can understand a little bit, about more, a little bit more about society and ourselves. And so I welcome you. And I want to start with a map to orient you to the Orient Internet. Um, oh, there's my button. Great. So this is a map, um, and it's a research that's um, been compiled, uh, not just by me, I'm, I'm just uh, the vessel for, um, for, vessel for this presentation, um, but um, by Jason Lee, my co-founder at the Civic Beat, by, uh, by Ruth Miller, um, who's our, our map maker. Um, Ruth Miller is here. Jason is based in Hong Kong. And a number of researchers um, who also contribute to the blog 88 Bar, um, a, a blog on a Chinese culture, Tricia Wong, Christina Shi, and others. And this is a very thin slice, again, of memes in Greater China. But uh, let's, let's look, walk through just to give you a lay of the land. Um, and first I want to define what a meme is. Um, a meme is a cultural unit on the internet that is both shared and modified. Um, it's not just something that you share with a bunch of your friends, it's also something that you play around with. Um, and so like a virus, it mutates and transforms from host to host. That's a very general sense of what a meme is. Um, how many of you posted rainbow um, profile pictures um, uh, recent, uh, this past weekend? How many of you participated in that red marriage equality meme two years ago where people were changing pictures into those red logos uh, for, for marriage equality? 
That's an example of a meme um, where people were remixing and posting images. Um, and those, those profile pictures um, have a precedent um, in uh, 2011 uh, when people were organizing for Cheng Guangcheng, a blind uh, lawyer and activist. Um, and people posted a bunch of selfies and profile pictures um, as a show of support for Chun, um, who, um, who wears sunglasses. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a blind lawyer, and, and these sunglasses became iconic. And so this became a way for advocating for um, his freedom. He was being held at illegal detention at the time. And, um, and there are a number of these different kinds of social advocacy memes. Um, and um, and one, another one that happened in 2011, June 2011, there's a major train crash in South, South China. Um, and um, it was uh, the high-speed rail, and it was seared into the Chinese consciousness because hundreds of people uh, were killed and injured. Those images um, you know, might, might traditionally have been censored in, um, um, on the Chinese web, but people um, created a number of memes. They, they remixed that, um, the image of the Ministry of Railway logo into these images of death and destruction. Um, someone actually transformed that logo into this comic, this web, web comic artist, Zico, and that turned into an actual com um, costume at a, at a cosplay convention. Um, and uh, there's an up, upwelling of support, and if you Google the, the Wenzhou train collision, you can learn more about how the internet played a role in upvoting the truth about what had happened. Um, the internet is also a great space for wordplay and puns. Um, one of my favorites is um, um, when, um, in two, I think it was 2009, 2010, um, you know, the, a young man named Li Qiming in, um, had, um, got, um, got involved in a fatal car crash, and he, um, and he didn't want to take legal responsibility for what had happened. And he said, my father, um, you should know, is Li Gang. My father is Li Gang. Well, Ba Shi Li Gang, um, because um, this was a way of saying my father is an important official in China. Um, and people really, you know, is this was one of the first major internet memes where people took that phrase, Waba Shili Gang, and they turned it into a number of puns. And here's one, here's just one example. There's an ancient Chinese Tang poem that says, Chuang Chen Ming Yue Guang, Yi Shi Di Shang Shuang. It means, before my bed, the bright moon, I think it is frost on the ground. And this is an example of people playing with um, cultural history and cultural artifacts because they changed it into Chuang Chen Ming Yue Guang, Waba Shili Gang. Before my bed, the bright moon, my father is Li Gang. There are a number of remixes like this. Um, as a way of calling attention to, um, to this, this sort of um, a haughtiness about, um, about one's privilege. Um, down in Shanghai, um, as we all know, cute animals and cute cats um, drive much of our culture shared on the internet. Um, thousands of dead pigs were found flowing into the Huangpu River in Shanghai, uh, 2013. Um, and, um, and it was obviously a major environmental issue. And um, people um, realized that um, you know, Life of Pi was a very popular film at the time. And, they, um, and a lot of comic artists turned this into a remix around pigs, pigs coming out of the water, Life of Pig, Angry Pigs, posters, and um, um, there's uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, is a pig. Um. <laughs> And it's um, and you know, uh, we all know about Chuck Norris memes. Everyone know like Chuck Norris is so strong he can do this and that. Um, in Wuhan, um, there's uh, there's this uh, uh, young man um, who um, was seen. He was part of the youth society and um, he um, was seen wearing a five stripes on his on his badge. But if you knew a little bit about the stripe system, um, it you know it indicated um, success, but it was a maximum of three stripes. Uh, so um, he became known as Five Stripe Boy and um, was um, heralded for his um, for his accomplishments. Um, and uh, his ability to um, to overcome, and of course another picture. Um, this is Brother Scorn, um, who um, himself became uh, part of this meme. Um, and if Five Stripe Boy uh, grew up and uh, was living in Beijing as a, as a party official, um, there, was, uh, there was talk um, in, I think it was 2012, where people were talking about Beijing Fashion Week. Um, but if you looked around in 2012, there was no Beijing Fashion Week at the time. So what were people talking about? They were talking about party officials who were wearing very expensive clothing. Um, so um, uh, there are people wearing um, you know, these, these um, you know, Italian blazers and their Hermes belts. Um, and so people were actually memeing them and turning them into um, these gifts. And, um, 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 and um, pictures in which they were identifying just how expensive this clothing that this clothing was, um, especially in contrast to the you know the kind of ostensible austerity that these officials um, should have been um, projecting. Um, and um, but it's not all about disrupting power. Sometimes memes are about enforcing power. I think we can all think of examples here in the United States. Um, uh, one uh, one very um, you know very classist and um, and mildly racist meme um, is, is called the locust meme. Um, in um, 
um, in uh, in Hong Kong, um, people um, you know, there was an advertisement that said Hong Kong people we've endured enough in silence. Are you willing for Hong Kong to spend one million Hong Kong dollars every 18 minutes to raise children born to mainland Chinese parents? Um, I think for a lot of us growing in California, this kind of notion of immigration of people crossing borders um, and um, um, so there's this this um, pejorative phrase people call um, called like immigrants called locusts. Um, and um, and with that ad though, um, a lot of people on Weibo actually took that ad. Um, if you look look again at that ad up there, they took that ad, they cleared it out, and they turned it into their, all their all, all other kinds of memes. Um, and so um, people in the, in the Fortran region, they they said, um, if you are Fortran, do not be a new Fortran. Became this commentary on uh, migration and on, on migrants. Um, the one on the right is about um, is about doctors wishing they had stronger wages. Um, it's not a, um, it's not all serious, as we all know. Memes can be a little crazy and um, strange. Um, this one says this one is a reference to the comic um, the cartoon about um, a pleasant goat and the wolf um, and it says there have been 600 cartoons in which this wolf has not eaten the pleasant goat haven't we had enough yet um, in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong is another, as um, you know, part of the Greater China region. Hong Kong has, um, you know, I'm sure we're very familiar with um, the Umbrella Movement um, in 2000, um, you know, this past year. Um, and uh, the Umbrella Movement, people were actually, um, it, it started, be, um, it started as Occupy um, Hong Kong, Occupy Central. Um, but when people started holding up umbrellas as a way to defend themselves against pepper spray, it made birth a new meme, um, and people started um, posting pictures of umbrellas. And in Hong Kong, where you have this, um, where you have a more, um, a more free speech opportunities in physical space, um, these umbrellas also took shape in the physical world. And so you, you, see, um, you see umbrellas um, showing up in chalk and in um, as actual paper umbrellas. And it's not all serious as well. Um, I think um, I think it's really important that my, again I um, I, I explain my research interests because they're one again one thin slice of the Chinese web. Um, there's a lot of fun things as well. This is a meme that um, Christina Shi um, at 88 Bar um, wrote about. Um, it's a pancake meme. Um, how many of you remember Rihanna's dress at the Metropolitan Museum? Well, it was really interesting because that became a meme in the West, um, and it became this kind of you know eggs that her her dress looked like eggs. But if you know if um, you know when you think about the, the cultural references that these memes are referencing, right? It's um, is that eggs are a popular breakfast dish in the United States, but um, in China it became a bing. It became a, 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 a pancake that's more um, or, or crepe that's more common. Um, and I want to close um, talking about Chinese, um, some of Chinese memes, um, by talking about the grass mud horse, and again, emphasizing the incredible creativity and brilliance on the Chinese web, and so many, so many weird things and dogs and cats. And uh, the grass mud horse, though, um, just to um, just to emphasize, this is one of the characters we're going to learn tonight in the workshop. Um, it is a peaceful, noble beast, um, and it is hidden. It doesn't look like much. Um, it looks like an alpaca. It's pronounced Tao Nima. Um, and if you speak Chinese, I see a lot of people are laughing. It sounds a lot like Cao Ni Ma, which means fuck your mother. Um, and the reason, the reason this, this is such a profane, um, is pr pr profane creature is because it has a mortal enemy. Its mortal enemy is the river crab, the Hoxie. The Hoxie sounds a lot like Hoxie, which means, um, which means sense, um, harmony. Um, and it was a Hu Jintao reference to a censored, harmonious internet. So by challenging harmony, by challenging the river crab as a grass mud horse, you're challenging internet censorship. And so this creature represents freedom on the Chinese web. And so there are all kinds of grass mud horse creatures and pictures and logos and plushies and dolls and cartoons and then fake Happy Meal toys and it's a this um, it's a very creative creature and people competed to create a new Chinese character and that's one of the char Chinese characters that doesn't exist in a dictionary but that you'll find on um, on the Chinese on um, that you'll you'll find um, some people referencing and that's one of the characters we'll be learning um, in the workshop this evening. So. Um, that is just one, um, you know, one very general overview of some of the many, many, many um, memes that are happening um, in different parts of um, different parts of China, and these are just ones that um, that we selected. And we'll be building this map on thecivicbeat.com and continuing to iterate on this. And um, if any of you are familiar with more memes, we'd love to get submissions. And so, um, so I hope this gives a, a, a one one little slice of um, of what's happening. Um, and so I want to, um, you know, the workshop tonight um, is uh, um, is curated by the Ch Chinese artist Ma Yongfeng, um, and he's a um, he's a, a great thinker. He started um, he started the project Forget Art, um, which is a social practice um, art collective, and um, that ran um, for about four years. Um, and um, and he really started it as a contrast to the kind of capitalist art market um, that he saw um, um, emerging in Beijing. 
Um, and so um, I, I knew Ma um, um, in uh, Beijing and I wanted to invite him to, to, uh, to curate the event, to, um, curate the workshop, even though he couldn't be here physically. Um, but I have a video, oops, um, I have a video of him, um, um, an interview. And so some of the audio um, didn't work out so well. We did it via Skype. So I might jump in and, um, and just uh, clarify um, some, of, some of the things he's saying. So um, here's the interview. Because the Chinese character um, hieroglyphic. I'm here saying the Chinese characters hieroglyphics um, are, are like hieroglyphic quality. I'm oh, sorry. Let me try this again. There we go. Because the Chinese character um, hieroglyphic script, you can say it is kind of an image, uh, image character. Until now, people still can say the graphic symbol inside of the, this, this kind of language. And, uh, and the, for them, every Chinese character, it's also easy to meaning uh, what to meaning divine the meaning of what's inside from this uh, from the from the word. For example, this word, um, and it's it's easy to let people imagine. Oh, maybe it's looking like a paper uh, kneel down and looks uh, embarrassed or very sad. When they speak on the internet, they use this kind of word. They invented some new words. For, for, for some new meaning, like Cao Ni Mao, Bai Gu Jing, or some Tang Qiang, and so on. And uh, at the last, <coughs> many of these words uh, to, to, uh, to, to deal with or some counter attacks uh, in that censorship. Because, uh, you know, in the Chinese government, they have a great wall, a GFW. They call it the Great Wall, a Great Fair Wall, to protect her to, and fill to some bad words. So, so the local paper and local messages they use the, the, the tradi uh, traditional Chinese language by turning them some old word into the new context. I selected uh, almost 10 words, 10 pounds of word play for this. But I, I choose five or four or five uh, very typical internet speak for, for this uh, workshop. And most people know uh, and know and, uh, and understand the, what's the meaning inside it. But for, maybe for the American, which is, um, it's not easy to understand. And this word uh, by Putin means, uh, you know, the uh, some uh, in, in English the white white girl spirit. Uh, it's a demon. It's uh, from the famous uh, Asian novel, uh, Journey to the West. Maybe many uh, there's some English uh, edition uh, English translation about this novel. So maybe some people know about this. It represents some kind of uh, class in China, and uh, this this word this word meaning the you know the Bai means the red color, Gu means the black bow, and Jin means the you know the elite. So they have uh, the look. There, see, it seems look like it looks like they are very beautiful. Officer lady, or you know, the handsome officer boy, or officer worker, and uh, they're wear very good, and uh, and work in the work in the very fancy building. But actually, they are facing, they are work very hard, and uh, and with a low salary. For them, some for these people, they also use this word as set as a second. As a kind of you know self mockery, or oh, you are you are like you are backputing or <laughs> I'm backputing or something. So it's not easy to understand. But I found on the Wikipedia there are some interesting word Chinese uh, internet words also appear in it. So that's very interesting. So so. 
So just the several words that let people to 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 know temper uh, China's Chinese society very easily in several minutes. So that's uh, that's that's it. Great. Um, so um, the characters that Ma talked about will be learning in the workshop, um, the calligraphy workshop this afternoon. Um, sorry, right after this event. Um, and so um, I would like to call up um, our two speakers who we have uh, physically here. Um, and um, the first one um, is uh, Xiao Wei Wang. Um, and Xiao Wei is an artist, a designer, and a researcher who's um, based here in San Francisco and travels a lot uh, back and forth to Asia. Um, and uh, when, um, she has a wonderful presentation about um, Chinese, another slice of Chinese digital culture. Um, Xiao Wei. Full disclosure, An and I also work together um, at a place called Midan, so I get to see her every day. Um, so today I'm going to talk about eight unbelievable things you absolutely won't believe about the Chinese internet art. Um, and a lot of my talk will focus on how this specific slice of digital art or new media art in China that's emerging is reflective of larger state aspirations, changes in society, um, and also the complexities of talking about Chinese internet. Um, so I'm going to actually start in 1997, um, which was a significant year because one, my dad bought us a compact Presario computer. And also because um, a formidable experience of my life was going to see Jiang Zemin in Boston. And a couple, three years prior to 1997, he introduced the internet to China. Um, and this is when the project of kind of censorship and um, you know, bringing the internet, a specific kind of internet to China began. Um, you have Taufler, uh, Alfred Taufler on the right, and you know, for him bringing the internet to China was really about shifting from an industrial age and understanding that China needed to go into this information age. Um, it was originally called the Golden Shield Project, which led to a lot of uh, condom jokes on the Chinese internet, um, which has fortunately morphed into the Great Firewall. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of discourse as the Great Firewall was being built. Um, you know, it was a chance for foreign companies to enter into a Chinese market. Um, and there's a lot, I want to emphasize how there's a lot of complexities because now as China is trying to maintain ec economic sovereign over its own internet related industries, um, a lot of the old discourse is what we're coming up against. And also when we, you know, when I talk to people about the Chinese internet, ultimately censorship and these ideas of rhetoric and free speech always comes up. Um, and I find it interesting because it's mixed in with, you know, I always ask people back, well, do you feel like the American internet is entirely free? We're not, you feel like we're not, you know, filtered or presented information by algorithms. Um, so it's interesting to see people's reactions. Um, and, you know, visiting China quite often, both when I was a lot younger, uh, this is what internet in China was. It was an internet cafe, seeing people do all sorts of weird, crazy things, uh, things that probably shouldn't be done in public. Um, and also a lot of the rhetoric of, you know, manufacture, copycat, um, China is where all this hardware is being made. And, you know, there's no creativity in China, there's only uh, imitation. Um, and it's interesting to see that being shifted as, you know, a middle class emerges, um, as an upper middle class emerges, and people become consumers and also creators of content on the internet. So my first point, um, and in no particular order, a little bit ADD, just like a good clickbait article, is that we need more specificity and we need to rethink what censorship on the internet really means as an ideological phrase for all of us. Um, we also need to think about who do we mean by Chinese internet users. So if we look at internet use and also GDP in China, we realize that 
actually a majority of people are in first tier cities. Um, and how many of you guys are familiar with first tier versus second, third tier cities? Okay, so a few of you. So first year city, it's Beijing, it's shiny, everything's glorious, you can get drone photographs of the city. And third year, there's not even a McDonald's. You have to go there on bus, you know, there's probably not even a KFC. It's still emerging, there's a lot of empty apartment buildings. Uh, first year is Fuardai, which uh, is a Chinese term that means like the uh, wealthy of government officials. You know, they're the people who get sent off abroad or, um, you know, people who are subject to conspicuous consumption, people who look very Western, quote unquote, in a way. And then third tier is Shamathe, which is the transliteration of smart. And this was very popular on the Chinese internet because it describes m young migrants that go to first tier cities. So from third tier cities and migrate to first tier cities like Beijing, they have this very uh, crazy goth pop, Korean pop style. Um, and it's pretty pervasive if you've ever tried to get your hair cut in China. And also a reminder that you know, there's this saying that when we talk about the Chinternet, we're always thinking about computers and spaces, uh, computers inside China. But the Chinternet, or the Chinese internet, also applies to um, Chinese language websites, media, and things outside of China. And we forget that the technologies that we create reflect actually our social and linguistic spaces. Um, and the kinds of, uh, you know, everything from kinship structures to the social networks we participate in, uh, that's what shapes the technology, not the technology shaping the opposite. So we have a picture of nice, neat uh, tech shop, and then we also have a picture of Zhongguancun, which is the startup district in Beijing, and it's messy, it's chaotic, it's, you know, in your face and collaborative in a different way. I want to point out that technological obsession comes in different forms. So a lot of the discourse on uh, recent Chinese internet uh, says, oh, well, people are just discovering internet. Wow, these wacky Chinese people, what will they, they do next? But digital media has actually been a pervasive form for artists in China, probably, you know, even alongside a lot of uh, American net art. So we have RMB City, which is by its Fei, and she did this in 2007. Um, and it was an entire city that was created on Second Life, open to interaction from people all throughout the world. Um, it's incredibly interesting as a piece because it reflects the technological obsession of that time, which is around the time of the Olympics, um, ideas of nation building through architecture, city building through, um, you know, structure, infrastructure. Um, so as a piece, it's really interesting because it uses technology, it uses internet, but that's not its primary obsession. Um, the primary function of this is to look at what it means to build a place. Um, more images of RMB city, um, using some of the architecture uh, that we know from Beijing. And then another example I want to talk about is Crystal CG, which how many of you guys have heard of Crystal CG? Um, okay, so Crystal CG is uh, this uh, basically rendering farm in China, and it you know does these lovely architectural renders that people throughout the world use. Um, and now it's actually shifted more towards interactive digital art. So uh, Crystal CG was founded in like 94. So it's been doing this for a while, but now as the zeitgeist has moved into, you know, thinking about internet as an economy in China, this, yeah, this company has also taken that on. So. And so media about art is also important to create a market. So we have some of the emerging Chinese artists, Chinese net artists who are being featured in Vogue and also in New York. And then also um, taste versus preference and consuming versus creative con creating content. Um, and we have to ask ourselves in creating this content, who owns that? 
Um, this is a question that um, Asbat Tian or Asper, Asper Time um, thinks about a lot. Uh, this is uh, one of their Taobao stores, so they the Chinese version of eBay, where they actually sell ideas for only two RMB. And also thinking about, you know, what does funding and what does this new neoliberal economy force artists into? So now that we all have to become entrepreneurs, um, even artists, we have to think about different ways of getting funding. And we think that we can each individually, you know, be like our time, our ideas, our bodies, our products of our labor. So um, thinking about creating a co-working space like the Chinese art artist uh, Xu Wenkai, who started Xin Dan Wei, which was one of the first great co-working spaces in Shanghai. Um, or this art project called Metaverse Nails, which has been pretty hot on uh, Chinese internet. It's uh, augmented reality nails that you can customize. Um, and they actually have an artist in residence. Um, and thinking about this idea of neoliberalism, of economics, and how that affects us, it's interesting for me to see this, you know, new kind of digital art market getting built and having a lot of the net, new net artists be female. So we have Wang Xinyi, so Wang New One, whose artworks focus around the body, around, you know, this kind of cybernetic discourse. Um, Whereas previously, a lot of the art ma market, you know, the big name artists, they have been male. Um, so I ho hope these are all recognizable to you guys. Um, they came out of the Stars Artist Exhibition in 1980, which you see is predominantly male. Um, now, a lot of them are female when we look at the artists. And so finally, just to end, um, it's a vast, <laughs> It's a vast task just to try, even try and decipher and uncover um, all the things that are going on the Chinese internet, especially in net art, is because you know it's being manufactured daily. But if you look hard enough, um, you'll find some pretty weird things. This is the most recent one I found. If you have WeChat, you should scan it. It's a really bizarre uh, app about. Uh, like smacking people, <laughs> basically. And okay, thank you. <laughs> right uh, to the stage is uh, Samantha Culp. Uh, Samantha is a culture producer, writer, and curator um, based in Los Angeles and Shanghai. And she's here to talk a little bit about her research. I'm Samantha. Wonderful to meet you all. Um, uh, and introduce me briefly. I've, so I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a California native, um, but have been living in greater China for the past 10 years. Um, first in Hong Kong, then in Beijing and Shanghai. And I work on many different things, kind of at the intersection of art and other industries. Um, let me just bring up my notes really quickly. Um, and I want to talk about, actually, Xiaowei gave me one of the best uh, intro <laughs> lead-ins to what I, I could ever imagine to what I want to talk about, which is not so much necessarily about the Chinese net artist scene, of which there are really cool people and it's awesome, but uh, it's not been my focus. I wanted to look a little bit beyond, actually, and at the interstice of contemporary Chinese net aesthetics and aesthetics even in a very broad kind of visual um, tonal sense, and then what is happening in the general contemporary art world globally. Oh yeah, I, so I made this poster myself um, very quickly just to have some image to start to disseminate online to my friends about this talk because again, images are so important to everything these days and especially for younger generations. It's like if it's a link and some words that doesn't really exist unless it's an image. So I made this image um, which is a f uh, an image that came from Taobao, uh, which I'll explain in a second, and also utilizes this font. I don't know if people who are uh, familiar with China and kind of um, working in multi-language contexts that uh, what happens 
happens a lot of times if you're typing in, Ch in a Chinese font and then you suddenly switch it over to Pinyin and start typing in English, um, it will have this very distinct looking typeface, which is not a real typeface. It's just a Chinese font that is suddenly being used with English characters. But you see this all over China, online, um, on printed signs, everywhere. And I find it's a really interesting way to look at the kind of uh, unpredictable fusing and mergings of um, across different cultures. Am I getting feedback? Okay, so Taobao. How many people know what Taobao is? Okay, Taobao is like, it's eBay plus Amazon plus Craigslist plus almost everything you can imagine. You can buy houses, baby animals, all kinds of services. You can buy uh, artist ideas, uh, everything, anything you can imagine, including lots of things that are illegal and that rapidly get shut down. Um, and then in this sort of soft way of being illegal, all kinds of fakes. Taobao became known in the beginning for the place to buy like fake Chanel bags, fake Birkin bags, um, but it is so much more than that. It also became known as the center for, uh, at least for just general consumers to look through, discover, um, and research and buy uh, Shanjai products. So Shanjai is a much bigger topic that I know. Do people are familiar with that? Shanjai, yes. So it's, uh, but what's interesting is going beyond um, uh, just technology, um, so Taobao being part of the Alibaba group, uh, what I became really fascinated by is how cultural producers of all kinds, including a lot of people who are making cell phone cases and whatever in the States, in the West, um, who are finding the manufacturers for their product via Alibaba to make all kinds of goods, primarily a lot of uh, technology goods. Um, so Taobao began in 2003, quickly became the central place to buy things online in China. Um, and w as soon as I started really looking at Taobao, living in China and trying to buy things uh, and trying to figure out how to buy things with my Chinese bank card, which was not easy, um, you found that I started finding that there's these really weird kind of advertising images, which, five, okay. Um, including this little girl with her banana uh, toy. Um, this, this was an image for uh, like art, um, but it's unclear what is the art. Is it the image or is it, the, is it a sculpture? Is it what's real and what's not real in a physical sense? Um, oh, this is kind of too, this is a really weird one because it was like a, like a couple and like this is a toy, but is it like their baby? It's like they couldn't have a child, I don't know. So really weird kind of uh, surrealist assemblages, collage style um, aesthetic that then triggers all these kinds of narratives and a confusion about what's real, what's fake, what's in between. Um, including uh, there is a Pomeranian climbing a tree, is it real, is it taxidermied? I have no idea. Um, so I had started kind of just myself collecting some of these images because I found them really fascinating. Then, um, as I got to know uh, a really interesting artist named Kim Lawton, who actually happens to be the boyfriend of Wang Wang Yuan, Wang Chiri, uh, who Xiao Wei showed. Kim is a, uh, I got to know via the internet first, and then someone said, oh, he lives down the street from you in Shanghai, which is really interesting. He's a British guy. He's very kind of reclusive, private. He lives online. He is definitely like an online digital native. And he began a Tumblr that was called Taobao Media. This was in that early 2003. So in the beginning, he just began using this is just me scrolling through because I wasn't sure if we would have Wi-Fi in here. So he just began collecting the images. And if you start to go through it, it's the most crazy collection. Am I getting feed? Oh, that's me scrolling, I guess. That's the sound of scrolling. Um, anyways. <laughs> It's worth going through, and I, I think there's no, I, I couldn't do a presentation and just like scroll through a Tumblr for, for eight, seven minutes, although I, I might have wanted to. Um, essentially, it's a repository of some of the most crazy visual things you can imagine, and to me, I'm like, this is way more interesting than most contemporary art, period. These are all images that they were just found on Taobao that might be, might be a big company, might be just some, you know, essentially like the equivalent of someone's mom who decided to sell plastic arm massagers and then she made these images with her smartphone in their house. Um, so 
I found Taobao Media to be a really, really interesting blog, curatorial project, research repository, whatever you want to call it, that highlights this really funny uh, interaction. And I can't, I, I don't even know yet uh, how to really determine which which direction the flow is going, but between kind of a general sort of mass aesthetic of Chinese online uh, commerce and contemporary art in the West and beyond. So Taba Media, you can explore it a lot more. I'll just, there, oh, here was some more in case I couldn't scroll. Some of these things, like this, when I first saw it, I also wasn't sure if this was a piece of Kim's art or if this was something from Taobao. It actually is from Taobao. Somebody, this is a real thing, you can buy a hovering, uh, 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 I don't know if it's a Confucius or a, what's that guy's name? Yeah. Um, all kinds of things. Okay, so I'll go quick. That's a really <laughs> crazy one. Perfect for this town, right? Um, <laughs> Okay, so then people are probably familiar with this term post-internet art, which is a very kind of controversial term. People are like, what does that mean? Internet's not over. Uh, so m mostly people, uh, the woman um, uh, whose name is escaped, oh, Marissa Olson, who kind of came up with this term, or she's claimed to have, describes it not so much as a culture past, beyond, or after the internet, but a culture that's so deeply embedded in and propelled by the internet that the notion of a world of culture or culture without or outside it becomes almost unimaginable and impossible. So post-internet arts become kind of a hot topic and a debated one in recent years. Last year, um, the uh, Yulin Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing had a show called Art Post-Internet, which was curated by, I think, friends of many of ours. Um, and it was a really great sort of survey show encapsulating this moment of art and, and examining it. Um, interestingly enough, it did not feature, uh, or it really was heavily featuring Western, meaning European, American um, artists who were working with this kind of visual vernacular. Um, and I think that that's interesting mainly because in some ways so much of what, you know, China is already ahead of the game <laughs> that uh, mass images circulating on Taobao are, are way more kind of adventurous, bizarre, surrealist than some of the things that are deliberately created as art pieces to be placed in the gallery. Um, this is, you know, another kind of recent show. I love a lot of these artists, by the way. There's no critique necessarily about the images not being like crazy enough. It's just that they're kind of approaching the same thing, but for totally different reasons. So a few other, you know, places when I started looking at this and thinking, you know, all these Taobao images and other images circulating through WeChat and other sources uh, look exactly like the kinds of things that artists are working very hard to craft on platforms such as Dis Magazine, the jogging, um, the archival aesthetics sort of circle of Facebook groups. Um, there's an artist collective called Shanjai Biennial that works very closely with this and other platforms. So I'm just going to go through some of the images. Um, Again, this sort of things on discs that play very much with stock imagery and um, you know medical equipment, but kind of riffing on it in different ways. The jogging was a Tumblr pro project that was also deliberately fuzzing this line between what is kind of just a, an image made to be a humorous meme and what is a piece of art and how it was then taken out of context. Um, a lot of things also, which I think were cribbed from Taobao uh, products that already existed, like this bug cell phone case. Um, Archival aesthetics, also very much delving into this kind of like vaporwave thing, which I won't have time to go into, but it's worth exploring uh, if you want to go into it further. This was a kind of a, you know, a relaxation online project, which the images looked exactly like, like Taobao advertising. Oh yeah, it's, it's very slowly kind of morphing. Um, even really recently in January, there was a project done called New Scenario Crash that was, uh, I think, in collaboration with like a limo rental company in Berlin where they got the limos and then they created these uh, CG virtual images posed within the limousine, um, which again, looked like something that is a nouveau riche fantasy from contemporary China and the Fuardai kind of class. I'll, I'll kind of skip over this right now. Um, so Kim Lawton, really, really interesting artist who working both collecting these things, I wrap it up, uh, and making his own works. Um, also in video, VJ, many other forms. Uh, I will go quickly. 
Aoto Uchi, another artist who recently had moved to Beijing, um, and uh, I think also shows, even though some of these artists, in a really weird way, who are uh, either working and living within China, but who are foreign and kind of have a different view of this and are making this kind of bridge between, because um, I think a lot of you know contemporary Chinese artists just will look at some of this and think, oh, that's really gauche and we don't like it, we want to move beyond that, but I think it is a source of fascination for a lot of Western artists still, um, this kind of imagery. Uh, this is something by Cheery. Um, Meta Haven, the kind of really cluttered graphic design aesthetic. They also riff a lot on kind of Gulf futurism and other, you know, just the presence of other languages, sort of, uh, and, and in some ways, some of this verges on, I'll get to the end of this, you know, the kind of uh, digital orientalism, similar to the kinds uh, that, you know, were uh, uh, embraced by Parisians in the last century, um, taking these forms, uh, like, just for their formal qualities, but in a way that was totally surprising. Um, I think that is where I will leave it. Oh, the main thing is that just this week, perfectly kind of making a full circle, uh, Kim has introduced the Taobao Media shirt line. So you can buy a sort of a meta shirt that has these images of other products. Um, and like he said, it is a great product for fans of products and it makes a gift for friends passionate about retail. Um, so I'll leave it there, uh, explore a lot of these artists' work, and I can share more about it later. Thank you. Thank you. That's so great. Thank I wanted you. to start, um, actually, a really quick question. Um, we didn't get a chance to define, um, oh, drink your water. What is Shanjai? Oh. Um, Shanjai refers to, I think in the most um, basic sense, it was referring to pirated goods. So, you know, here's the, an, a real iPhone, here is something that is like an iPhone, but it's not actually made by Apple. Mm -hmm. But then I think most interestingly, it became expanded to you know, the products themselves fitting in that category became really incredibly innovative far beyond um, what some of the original products were. So it would be an, an Apple, an orange phone instead of an Apple, but it had three SIM card slots and a cigarette lighter on the back and whatever. So it was kind of this digital, it's more like a remixing, a manufacturing remixing of products, not sheer uh, piracy. Yeah. So can, you, can you talk a little bit about um, what you see with this kind of cultural influence? It's like, you know, you have this Shanjai, it's big, big Seems, seems to be influenced by Western products. And then you showed, me, showed us all these amazing artists. Yeah. Who are in, in, I love this term, yes. digital orientalism. Yeah. How, how is this cycle, you know, what, is, what, is, what have you seen in this, this kind of cycle of like cultural influence? And, mm -hmm. how is that, and also, like, how is that affecting you know, how, how the art market is functioning as, they, as mm -hmm. they're rebuying? Um, what is a remixing of a, an original remix of some other remix? Absolutely, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I don't, um, I think, I, and we, a few years ago when I worked on the project in the Netherlands and invited you to speak that was called No More Westerns, and it was a festival kind of looking at these alternative flows of global culture. What happens when, you know, the so-called the BRIC countries, the uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, economically have this immense power. Does that also translate to kind of a cultural power? Um, how, what changes in this conversation? And uh, I think it's both ways. I think that obviously these images and the kind of uh, aesthetic has a real power and that's what travels through the net and that is totally kind of, you know, transmittable. Um, for many, many new media artists in general, it's very hard to find a market uh, still, and I don't know if that's necessarily changing, and still I think some of the artists who are then using this same kind of visual language who have offline practices, then that's still who maybe benefits the most uh, you know, market-wise, mm -hmm. but I don't think that it's as clear-cut even, and I showed at the very end, the like Picasso and the um, Cubist influence but from kind of traditional African art, which was a very much, uh, you know, part of a very clear colonial project and really problematic in many, many ways. I think that this might be also, but maybe in a different way. And I, yeah. I don't know, I would love also other people's thoughts about that. Because I think it's a, m a bit more of an exchange still and a kind of a circular process. That'd be great to explore. Yeah. 
Um, before I open up, I have another question. One, one other question, and we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, it's for Xiao Wei. Um, you, you mentioned a lot about um, that. You know, um, I think it's really striking um, for a lot of people who follow Chinese art. Um, a lot of Chinese artists who are popular in the West are often men, um, and yet, you know, the examples you gave of you know, just really innovative Chinese net artists um, are often women. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how the internet is is both providing, you know, on one hand, providing an avenue for um, you know creative exploration for um, for um, for for more, um, you know, more diverse uh, types of artists, um, but at the same time, um, you, you, you talked about the kind of challenges of funding models. Um, so, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about, you know, the relationship with net art um, and um, and the market, um, and um, and specifically um, how that's both op created opportunities, but maybe limited opportunities for Chinese um, female artists. All right. So, I think it's particularly of note that uh, new media artists, which it's hard to find funding for unless you're sponsored by a tech company or something like that. Um, you know that is becoming predominantly women. Um, what's interesting about the movement is that uh, it was Zhang Pei Li, who is a male video artist, who was kind of like the father of video art in China, who uh, kind of nurtured these new media tendencies um, in a lot of the younger artists. I think part of it is this um, both generational shift of you know digital natives um, who are growing up and becoming artists, but then also a question of practicality and probably you know societal pressures as you're going through art school. What what kind of shapes your aesthetics? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. So I'd love to open it up to the to the room um, and. Um, you direct me. Oh, great. Okay. And uh, we'll probably take uh, just a few questions. Um, and so um, I saw your hands come up first. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for having this. This is really uh, awesome and insightful. Uh, one of the things that um, I had a question about was in regards to the memes and how people share these among their communities. Like, we have Reddit, we have 4chan, we have these types of uh, software platforms here. Right. But how have you seen that grow and evolve abroad? Um, abroad meaning in China? Right. Yes. Um, so, um, so in, in, uh, China has um, a, a, its own a, a, its own landscape of social media. Um, a lot of, because of uh, some of the dynamics with censorship that Xiao Wei was talking about. There, there are a number of um, kind of uh, what some are sometimes called parallel social media networks, which um, which I don't quite think is right because it, it gives this implication that a site like Weibo, which people call the Chinese Twitter, is exactly like Twitter, which um, but it's quite different. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are a number of platforms like Weibo, um, which means microblog. Um, there's um, there's um, there's WeChat which is um, kind of similar to WhatsApp and, and Viber, but not quite. It's a, it's a very rich social network. Um, and so there are a number of um, different platforms. People will, will go into user forums and chats. Um, a lot of the, the memes that I was um, exploring were, um, were coming from Weibo. Um, but um, but you, you'll find, like just like um, in the US, um, you'll find that's a very different sorts of, different types of memes cultures depending on the platform you're looking at and kind of um, thinking about the, the viral dynamics um, of that, that each platform allows for. So. Hi, I was wondering if you could help explain um, the phenomenon where you use graphic images to, as a short, uh, like sort of as a substitute for censored language, like that funny rubber duck for Tiananmen Square, or and 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 what's the turnover for? How long is like a visual symbol for a touchy subject? Like how long does that last? Can it last like 12 hours or six hours? What's the turnover for images? And and how do you commu You're basically communicating in shorthand. Like an, as if it's a community of inside jokes that are being passed around. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and explain how that plays out in your experience. Um, I guess um, I'll, um, so. In regards to um, images that circulate, you know, you, you do have you have a wide, 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 very wide range. Um, the uh, the grass mud horse has been, um, you know, it's been studied since at least I think 2008, 2009, um, and is still a very popular meme. Um, and um, there's there's some evidence that it's kind of it's been kind of um, re, you know re um, uh, kind of uh, uh, what do you call it? reclaimed um, by by the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm Mm -hmm. 
Um, they, they sort of, but then, um, but then so you saw the grass mud horse pop up as an actual emoji that could be selected within Sina Weibo. And so, to a certain extent, it became reclaimed as kind of a, as part of the uh, uh, kind of commercial ethos of, of Weibo. Um, and um, but other memes, uh, depending on you know the, the one um, when we're talking, and again, we're talking just about social justice, um, kind of um, anti-censorship memes, um, like the ones about the um, yeah the duck um, will disappear very quickly, or the uh, the sunglasses meme lasted for maybe three or four months. Um, and so. Uh, there's a wide range, and just like um, just like in the U.S., um, you'll you'll have memes that seem to be a flash in the pan, and others that seem to endure. Um, I'd love to take a few questions uh, to uh, relation to, especially uh, Xiao Wei and Samantha's, uh, excuse me, research as well. Yes. Thank, thank you. Um, so when I was growing up, I remember uh, people going to art school. I, I grew up in a university in China, so when people were going to art school, my parents would tell me, oh, these are people who are coming from kind of like lower class background. They go to art school because they can't really go into science, engineering, whatever. Uh, it seems like with, with the internet, a lot of people are able to create art and online, digital art, all kinds of tools out there. It's easier, it's more accessible, but it seems to be a different kind of art that people are creating. And young generations are creating it's not necessarily that that's indicating some sort of like class friction or, or anything like that it seems super just pretty uh, pervasive around the society so I don't know if there's any shift kind of you see it, living in China for, for 10 plus years or going back and forth that like bridging these two gaps people going into art school going to traditional art versus people creating images like this for example on the internet hmm. thank you well, I found that a lot of young Chinese artists are also getting more opportunities to go abroad and attend like you know Dutch new media programs and things like that. Um, I would say also that the slice of digital internet art that we're talking about or that we see um, kind of in inst more institutionalized settings that does tend to be the product of people who grew up in first year cities and went to you know CAFA or um, other prestigious art schools. Um, less so maybe like a migrant who's going to Beijing for the first time but you know there's also that kind of democracy of that medium mm -hmm. uh, yeah I was gonna say also I think an interesting weird thing is that um, for China that maybe you know new media art has been such a small pool for so long and that's been very surprising to so many people and I think that one factor some critics and curators look at is about how the past whatever 15 years of Chinese contemporary art with the market exploding and all of a sudden very young artists getting immense resources and also still leading back to this idea of Chinese production and labor still being very cheap that you know for a young artist who wants to do like you know make a make a train out of wood like but full-scale train that they can do that as opposed to maybe a young artist in San Francisco who wants to do that they have to just do it with CG imagery so then they're getting into so I think it's kind of a weird like as the market then has changed and suddenly artists uh, had all of these resources they're going really big and really IRL um, so it wasn't they weren't forced to explore these platforms until maybe now and that, that it's coming up for different reasons hmm. um, maybe um, two more questions yeah um, yes Hey, um, this is kind of a selfish question, but I'm wondering, are there places where um, folks outside of China can sort of learn more about what's going on in China in like a sort of, you know, often updated way? Like, is there somebody cataloging or quickly sort of like describing for people who are not fluent in Chinese to sort of follow along with what's going on? That's question yeah. one. Oh, and, and only uh, if, I can, if I can say it. Okay, then I don't want that one. It's actually the other question. No, I'm <laughs> okay. kidding. You can, you can answer the first one. That's fine. Sure. <laughs> Sure. That's good. No, the first one is okay. fine. Oh, the first one. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, would you guys like to... Um, and you're speaking specifically about Chinese digital culture or just general Chinese society? Yeah, I mean, society? I, like most people in this room, I mean, I find the memes that go on in America so fascinating and I, I learn about them quickly because I'm fluent in that, mm. not only the language, mm -hmm. like the actual language, but that internet language. I'm wondering, like, are there places where we can get a window into that in China. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say, I mean, definitely a few curators that I think all of us know, like mm -hmm. Michelle Priscal. Michelle. Yeah. Um, and also WeChat is a great resource. Mm -hmm. If you um, get on WeChat and follow the right people and go to the moments section, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's a really great way to see, you know, up to the minute what's going on. You said Michelle Priscal? Yeah. Priscal. 
Proxel. Proxel? I think so. Yes. P R O K S E L O. Yeah. Um, who, and then for, she, she, the site is called netize.net, um, where she's like been tracking eyes this Like eyes as in like eyeballs? Uh, N E T I Z E. Dot net. Oh, cool. Um, that I didn't even get. To, I thought maybe you were going to talk about your talks that I didn't <laughs> put her in, but she's amazing. She's been tracking it very closely. For general meme stuff, I would also say Civic Beat <laughs> is definitely the place where I learn about a lot of it. So, yes. And um, 88 Bar. Eight, um, yes. 88 Bar is a good one. Um, and, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm biased. It's, it's, it's a blog I contribute to. <laughs> um, and uh, China Digital Times and um, is uh, often um, from a political angle. Um, and then China Smack. Um, it's oh, kind yeah. of the, the kind of trashy BuzzFeed mm -hmm. angle, so um, it's, a, it's a, a, a very, that's a pretty big mix. Oh, and also the Cynocism uh, news, yeah. newsletter, which sends you updates. It's really, really good. Yeah, that's right. Cynocism. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, um, one more question. Hi, um, I have a question, maybe more for Samantha, um, since you brought up the post-internet idea. Mm. And I'm, I'm curious, how do you, because you also kind of did a little bit of comparison of the show at Ulan's mm -hmm. and some of the artists from China that you mentioned. I'm just curious because a lot of these projects that Chinese artists are doing is very playful and almost have this sort of, um, self-indulgent um, tendencies among a group of people that kind of wanted to be part of this and also this tendency of still fascinated about this tool maybe like how the internet and digital sort of facilitating the aesthetic and everything I'm just wondering what do you think like um, is there any like self-reflection and self-critical towards this tendency or this whole idea of post-internet? And like, do you find these art in a deeper meaning, like rather than just okay, we're having fun of these nails, sort of doing a show? You know, like I'm I'm just curious about that and how you take on that. Um, yeah, well, I would love to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, well, for one, with the nails, it's funny because I actually I also work with that artist Tia Bauman, who again she's uh, you know she's a foreigner, she's she's Vietnamese Australian, but entered China um, specifically to sort of research art and to start this product, which is a digital and physical product and kind of a very new way of thinking about an artist's product. Um, do I think there's any kind of a self criticism? Yeah. I, I just want yeah. to kind of place such art in the bigger picture of the, you know, contemporary art production. And see what kind of role they're playing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I think that's one thing people maybe have criticized a lot of the Western post-internet art for not being that kind of seeming, being seemingly uh, apolitical. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. It just depends on wh how deep you're looking and what, you know, how much else you're reading of those artists' texts. And many of them, I think some of the best new me uh, post-internet and new media artists are actually really, really good writers. And maybe even their writing is even better than their works, yeah. I think. Um, and uh, the thing I didn't really get to even to get into, and I'm definitely not an expert about it, is kind of, I'm very intrigued by this kind of the no, new kind of really materialism and animism and the things that people like Anselm Franca are looking at, which is more, you know, again, you could say, is that apolitical? Is it political? It does have to do with production and labor, but in a much more kind of, it's not uh, immediately readable um, necessarily from like looking at like a weird shoe made out of jello or whatever, but like really when you're looking at it in a deeper way and the conversations around it, I think there's a lot of criticism and it's ultimately a lot of criticism about late capitalism. Um, so yeah, I think it may not be about like social movements in the similar way as social practice here or even of some of the other artists, you know, are my own phone, but um, I don't know, that would be my reply to that. Yeah, you, I, I agree. And I think yeah. you're dealing with a very, not far more complex, but in d d there's a lot more nuances in like the social mm -hmm. landscape. So that mm -hmm. kind of criticality and how political can you be? It's expressed in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah.
great. That's a good question. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I promised a, um, I would come back to this photo, and, um, and it makes, uh, makes, will make some sense. Um, as, as we close the event, um, and please remember there's a workshop afterward we'll be looking at uh, Chinese puns. Um, I just wanted to show some of the work of uh, the Chinese, um, Chinese artist who's based here, his name is Ethan Wong, and he's been photographing his native city of Chengdu, um, and uh, this is a century global city, a new mall. And he's just really interested in how people are just the stance of people taking pictures, um, and, um, and kind of the, the rise of both the, the new cities and, um, and the new, new types of cities in China um, and new, new buildings, but also the rise of the smartphone and the kind of networked image. Um, and, um, and I just really love um, his work and um, I wanted him to be here, but he's, um, he's in Chengdu, so I wanted to show a little bit of it. Um, and, um, and here's really capturing that stance, this kind of global stance of the, the person holding, um, holding up a device. Um, and it's really interesting because I've become really obsessed with selfie sticks lately. And, um, and this idea of like this new stance that's enabled so this selfie stick is enabled by, um, you know, it's enabled by the networked camera. Network camera creates a networked image, and the networked image enters a network. And so um, it's an interesting mix of, um, you know, interesting enabling of digital culture, um, which is all just an opening, really, for me, because I really just want to take a selfie before we um, close the event. Um, if I could ask our um, their panelists, and I, I just want to take a selfie of everybody using the selfie yeah, stick. Yeah, should get down here. Um, okay, let me just turn this around. Can, can we see everybody? Okay, great. Okay, is it working? Okay, yeah, come on, come on. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, yes. Are we all, are you all fitting? Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to do like this side. Okay, okay, everyone raise your hands. Ah, one, two, three. Okay, and one more. Okay, one, two, three. Great. Thank you so much. 